going to start us, Joel? <clears throat> okay. Yes. Good morning to you all. And, uh, and welcome to you all. I, if you have um, logged in here, I probably have muted you, and that's just for the sake of keeping our, our recording on track so that you can hear us okay. But if you want to speak up, you certainly can unmute yourself and uh, come back in. So in just a moment, I will ask uh, Pastor Denny Halarsis to lead us in prayer, if you'll be willing to do so. Um, but I want to just briefly introduce a few things about the course and welcome you to the class, get you to know, uh, let you know a little bit about what's going on. And then I'll lead us in prayer and, and hand it over to Dr. McGonagall for our first lecture. So uh, welcome to the first class in Foundations of Preaching. More broadly, uh, welcome to the first class in the Masters of Arts program. This is the first class and first lecture that we've offered, therefore, in, uh, on this level. And if you've seen or if you're familiar, or even if you're not with what we've done, I'm looking across the names, I think everyone is familiar. So far, we have worked really at investing on the doctoral level, and we have an ongoing class happening there, systematic theology, advanced systematic theology. If you see the word advanced in front of a class, that means it's on the doctoral level. If you see foundations of in front of a class, that means it's going to be taught like this on the master's level. And uh, the goal really in both is the same. It is to provide education across the world, wherever your situation, wherever you're at, you can get solid, solid classwork and training um, just through an internet connection. And the people that the Lord has brought along, such as Dr. McGonagall, volunteering very generously, giving of their, of their time to teach these classes. Um, these are, these are top-rate professors. Dr. McGonagall is working in this field basically every day. Um, he's teaching the, the preaching classes at BJU and pouring himself into that. And so he's worked through so many of these questions, having him come in and give two hours of his time. It's a, it's a, it's a tremendous privilege. I'm looking forward to hearing what he'll have to say to us. Um, let me give just a few logistical things though, just so that you know what's going on here. I'm going to show you over on the other screen um, where you would sign up to get the kind of the homework access or the logistical side of the class. And so if you, if you have not already done this, this is definitely something you need to do. Um, you can come here and I sent you this link via email. If you ha already have a password from a previous class, you just sign in normally. If not, you can create a new account here. And once you do so, having created your new account, it's going to take you into a second window. Um, if you've already logged in, hopefully you've seen this. This is an important screen to see. And it's uh, this Foundations of Preaching window, the Moodle page. Um, what you're looking at then is lecture by lecture, different assignments. So you have a an assignment for this lecture that you would put down what you view as the five most significant texts for establishing a biblical view of preaching. Ideally, you would do that prior to the class. So it's a pre-class assignment. Um, you'll see sometimes pre-class and post-class, okay? And so after a class, sometimes I'll put up something that'll ask you to you know, give some questions and so forth. Here, pre-class, I'm asking you to do that if you can before the class. If you've not already, that's fine. It's our first lecture. You may not know the routine yet, no problem. Um, so anyway, if you're able to go ahead and take care of that, even after the class and in the future, try to check before a lecture and just see what's going on there. But this is where you're gonna have some of that interaction and so forth. Um, you also should have received a link to the syllabus. And if you did not see that, be sure to take a look at it. Uh, the syllabus here is a list of the lectures that are happening. And so you can see through that um, just what to expect for each individual lecture, followed by just a discussion of the different details, some of the requirements and the expectations. And we're going to work with some of this. Um, you can see the, the textbook for the course here. It's available on Kindle. It's fairly inexpensive. And also um, we'll work with some papers and such that you'll turn on. Um, I definitely want to introduce as well Dr. Oberlin. He and I work together to create this project. And um, 
I'm very, very grateful for the significant time that he's put into just strategizing, thinking through creating some of these ideas. Uh, Dr. Oberlin, I don't know if anything you want to share as well or anything that comes to your mind about the class. Thank you so much. Um, we're just so thankful to be have you in this course and we're so looking forward to um, really learning with you about how better to serve uh, those um, who want to be part of this. And I'm so thankful for Dr. McGonigal, and I'll just, I know um, Joel's going to say more about him, but he's actually my pastor. So I get to hear him week by week preach the gospel uh, and to handle the word. And so I'm really excited that um, I get to share, you, share him with you in that sense, and, and that it's a real privilege um, for me to be part of his congregation. So um, I'm just thankful for him to be part of this as well. And of course, I'm thankful for Dr. Arnold and just all his hard work and setting things up. He is a, he's a brilliant guy that can put things together and uh, make it happen. So I'm thankful to partner with him on this. Well, thank you. Great. Um, okay. Well, I'm, I'm not going to take any more of Dr. McGonigal's time except to mention one other thing here. And that is just a suggestion or actually it's a request, something you can help us with. Um, if you've been in the previous classes, we're making an adjustment there and we want to, want to do the same here. And that is if you would be willing to turn on your camera during the classes. Okay, now I, I totally understand how this works. Um, you know, so for me, it's in the morning, depending on the time where you are in the world. And then sometimes you have kids in the room or you have other things going on. Okay, so it's, it is easier to turn off the camera um, and that allows you to do other things and so forth. But um, I have found personally, when I am in a class, if I don't have the camera on, I get distracted. <laughs> and uh, that, that helps me then focus just because I know that the communication is two ways. I know that the teacher is also watching me or working, you know, there's a, there's a two way direction, two way communication. And that takes me to the second reason and probably maybe the, the larger reason. And that is that it helps a lot as the teacher, if you can see the class, you know what ideas are getting communicated and what made sense to people uh, because you get a response from them. And so the visual feedback back from them, okay, they get it, all right, that made sense, that connected, okay, helps you move on to another thing or helps you explain when something's not making sense. And so it's really a way of helping to communicate to your teacher, support him, help him know kind of how to communicate back to you. So I commend that to you as well. Um, I would just say if you are able or willing to turn on your camera, that will help. This will not be in the recording that goes online. Certainly it's just for this time, just for the teacher, uh, the other students. So that's an, an encouragement. I hope you'll, you'll um, make avail of that. I think you'll benefit more from the class if you do. There will be people that, people that will watch this class afterwards in the video form. I would suggest just for all of us, you, you will get more benefit if you watch the classes live. That's very much true. I find that for myself. I can interact. I can, I can message and so forth. So if you're able in your schedule to watch live, I think you'll benefit more from the class. Uh, it, but if for whatever reason, you know, today I'm limited on my internet. I may not be able to finish the class. If so, I'll just catch the rest of it online and through the video link. Okay, uh, that's it. Pastor Halarsis, if you're willing or able to pray for us, and then we'll look forward to hearing Dr. McGonagall and what he has to share with us today. Okay, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are very much thankful for giving us the opportunity to study and to dig deeper thy word. And thank you, Lord God, for using Dr. Arnold and uh, Dr. Oberdeen for initiating this program so that we can uh, attain this uh, level of education. Thank you so much, Lord. Be with us tonight and continue to give us understanding and knowledge about the subject matter. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Am I ready to go? Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Good. Well, it's good to 
see you this morning, uh, at least from my uh, geographical standpoint. And uh, I'm excited to work with you guys uh, through some theological, some biblical um, material related to the foundations of preaching. And, um, you know, I've, t I've taught homiletics or the art science of preaching for a number of years now. And I have preached uh, quite a bit. Um, I'm a pastor of a church here in Simpsonville, South Carolina. But I always feel like I need to go back to the uh, basics. I need to go back and remind myself of the biblical foundations, the theological foundations for what I'm doing on a week-to-week -week basis. And I don't know where you are in terms of your uh, training to minister the Word or your ability to minister the Word, but I know what we're looking at today is uh, necessary for us all to consider what is the biblical foundation for preaching. And, you know, before we get into the, you know, before you get into the step-by-step -step method of how to do it, it's important that we take a step back and ask, why are we doing this? And um, what is the role and responsibility of the task of the preacher of God's Word? So we're going to talk a little bit this morning about uh, the theology and philosophy of preaching. And uh, I want to give you three theological foundations for preaching. Uh, these come from a book by Peter Adam called Speaking God's Words, A Practical Theology of Preaching. And I would highly recommend that book to you. Uh, the first foundation that you'll want to note is that God has spoken. God has spoken. Uh, the second foundation is this, that it is written. And the third theological foundation is this, preach the word. So God has spoken. It is written. Preach the word. And those are three simple but powerful theological, biblical foundations for preaching. So uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and get out your Bibles. We're going to be looking at some uh, passages here, but uh, let's talk about that first theological foundation. Um, God has spoken. The Word of God, God's revelation of Himself. God has communicated Himself to us. And I just want to make the point that there, there can't be any preaching of the Word of God unless we believe that God has spoken, right? In other words, that's the foundational uh, issue. There's no preaching of the Word of God unless God has spoken. We can't stand up and say to God's people, thus says the Lord, unless we believe, first of all, that the Lord has spoken. And there's no doubt that God is a speaking God. Um, we won't turn there, but if you were just to look at the opening account in Genesis you would see numbers of references to God's speech. So the first uh, phrase right out of the gate in Genesis chapter 1 is, in the beginning, God. God is the central character, the central focus of Scripture. And in chapter 1, verse 3, it says, God said. Chapter 1, verse 9, and God said. Chapter 1, verse 14, and God said. Chapter 1, verse 20, and God said. Chapter 1, verse 24, and God said. Chapter 1, verse 26, and God said. Chapter 1, verse 29, and God, you feel it, it said, right? Um, right from the beginning, the opening chapter of Genesis, you have this repetition of the idea that God speaks. And if you look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, this is a powerful uh, opening passage in this uh, wonderful epistle, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, tells us that God at uh, many times and in divers or, or, or various ways spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So in the past, God spoke through various ways, through various channels, through various methods, Prophets, but uh, the author of Hebrews is arguing that God has spoken in these last days in a special way, in a unique way, in a climactic way, through his son Jesus Christ. But, but the point is, and the emphasis is in that first verse of Hebrews chapter 1, that God has spoken. God, who spake, has spoken. 
So again, remember what we're trying to do here. We're trying to build a philosophy, a biblical philosophy of preaching. And there can't be any preaching of the word unless we believe that God has spoken. And the scriptural teaching is clear. God is a speaking God. And Jesus believed in the reality of a God who speaks. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus answered Satan and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, can you finish, finish this? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In other words, Jesus is testifying to the fact that there are words that come from the mouth of God. And in John chapter 17, verse 8, Jesus says, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. So God gave Jesus words for Jesus to communicate. So again, that, that first foundational truth, God is a speaking God. In fact, uh, when you look at Scripture, this is one of the proofs that, that the God of the Bible is the one true and living God, that he's the only true God, is the fact that he speaks. Uh, Psalm 115, verses 3 through 5 and verse 7 says, But our God is in the heavens. He has done whatever he pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. In other words, in referring to the idols, the false gods, the so-called gods, they have mouths that have been crafted and fashioned by man, but they don't speak. Neither speak they through their throat. In other words, the point is that one of the things that sets God apart, that distinguishes God, the God of the Bible, from all so-called gods or rivals, is the fact that he speaks. And because God and his words are actually inseparable, you, you, can't, you can't separate God from his words, um, What's true of God is true of his words in the sense that they are effective. They are powerful. Um, they accomplish God's will. When God has a desire and he has a purpose and he wants to accomplish that purpose, he, he does it through means of his word. Um, think back to that Genesis uh, record that I mentioned earlier. And God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. Uh, what happens after God speaks? Right. What happens after God says something? Well, whatever he says happens, right? If, if God says, let there be light, what's the result? There's light, right? Um, look at Isaiah chapter 55. This is a wonderful passage in the Old Testament that also speaks of the power and the effectiveness of God's words. Isaiah chapter 55, verses uh, 10 through 11. Some beautiful imagery here that we have in the Old Testament regarding the Word of God. The Word of God says, For as the rain comes down and, and the snow from heaven and, and doesn't return until it waters the earth and makes it to bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void or empty, but it, that is my word, shall accomplish what I please, and it shall succeed in the matter for which I sent it. In other words, just like the rain and the snow comes down and, and accomplishes the purposes that, that God has for it, so God's word always is successful. It's always going to accomplish its purposes because you can't separate God's word from God himself. And whatever God purposes to do, he does. Whatever God wills to do happens. Um, the word has that kind of power. The word has that kind of, of successfulness. And that's a huge encouragement to us as preachers, isn't it? In fact, this is one of those uh, passages that I fall back on uh, week by week, when I think about uh, what I'm doing in preaching the Word. And, and sometimes we feel like we don't have much um, power in and of ourselves and that we're not really accomplishing very much. And I think of this passage and I remind myself that whenever the Word of God is preached, that Word is going to accomplish God's purposes. Sometimes those purposes are not exactly the same as our purposes, 
But nevertheless, God always accomplishes what he purposes to do. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. <clears throat> Uh, if you want to look there, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually works or performs its work in you that believe. So listen to that again. It's the word of God that effectually works. It's the word of God that performs God's work. So we could say, you know, to use a big, big term, we, we could say the word of God is performative. It, it performs God's purposes uh, or God's will or God's desire. That's just how powerful it is. Um, and then think about Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is, is quick. It's it's alive, it's, it's active, it's living, and it's powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Um, the Word of God is alive, it's, it's active, and so there's a sense in which as we preach God's Word, we are simply letting the Word loose, we're letting it we're unleashing it to accomplish its purposes, God's purposes. And what are those? Well, um, one of the things you see God accomplishing through his word is salvation. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It's the Word of God that is uh, instrumental in, in bringing people to faith. And I'm sure you've, you've um, encountered people. Perhaps your own testimony is that you came to faith in Christ uh, simply by means of hearing the Word of God, maybe read the, read the Bible, or you heard somebody just reading Scripture, and God enlightened you, illumined you to uh, salvation. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, now listen to this, the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation. The, the scriptures have this ability, they have this capacity to make people wise into salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. James chapter 1, verse 18, of his own will he begat us, or he gave us birth, he gave birth to us through the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Um, so we were begotten. We, we experienced the new birth. We were regenerated by means of this word of God. Same thing in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 to 25, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God being born again by the Word of God. In other words, when we preach God's Word, we have this confidence that it, is, uh, it, it has the capacity, the ability to uh, actually enlighten people's eyes and bring them to faith in Christ. So God's Word accomplishes salvation, but it also accomplishes sanctification. It also has the capacity to move believers along the process of becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus says in his high priestly prayer, sanctify them through thy truth. Set them apart through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the means of this sanctification is the word of God. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. Again, remember what we're doing. We're we're establishing this, this uh, there are three pillars in our biblical theology of preaching. The first is that God has spoken. The second is that it is written. And the third is preach that word. So we're talking about the word of God as God's revelation of himself. And we're talking about the power of that word. And then we'll talk about some of the, the implications or the consequences or the applications of that. But we have to root our thinking and our understanding about the word from the word itself. Uh, so Ephesians chapter 5, 
Paul says to husbands that they are to love their wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify, uh, having cleansed her by the washing of water by the word, okay? That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water by or through the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish. And then 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, a classic uh, text that we'll actually be looking at a little bit later. But Paul says that all Scripture is breathed out by God. And because it comes from God, because it's sourced in God, it actually has inherent usefulness. It has inherent profitability. It's, it's, it has this... Um, uh, utilitarian kind of, of, of purpose, and that is that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, or thoroughly equipped for every good work. But again, it goes back to the Word as the source of this, the Word as, um, as the, the means of this perfection and, and equipping of God's people for the work of God. So all that to say this, uh, there are several, I think, significant implications uh, to the fact that God has uh, spoken. The first of those is this. Since God has chosen to reveal himself, especially through words, um, man's response to God's words is man's response to God himself. In other words, you can't separate the two. Uh, God's speech is connected to God himself. So our response... Okay, maybe, um, I don't know, Dr. Oberlin, if you're able to, to give Dr. McGonigal a phone call, maybe we can get him back online that way. Um, and in the meantime, while we're waiting to see if we can get that work out, uh, if there's a way to reach him otherwise, I'm not sure if he knows that he cut off, but uh, maybe we'll shoot him an email as well. I hope you'll notice over on the side that you, um, I did put up a, I did put up a handout. So if you want to download that, you should be able to click the link there in the chat and that link would take you out to his handout. Um, I'll just go ahead and open that here. If you want to take a look at that, these kinds of things will also be available each time on the Moodle page. So if you come up later and you're wanting to get the handout or get access to one of them, you can always pick them up that way. Um, the handout is here if you're interested in grabbing that. Um, and it looks like we have some blanks so far that we can fill out in the way. Um, okay, and we'll see if Dr. Uh, McGonigal is able to come back in. Hopefully we'll pick up where he, was left, where he left off. Um, any input that I could get from you or I could solicit from you in the meantime, let's just, let's just try to think through briefly what he's setting as our foundation. Um, so if someone, what would you, just recovering, what were the three foundations that he gave us up to this point? And uh, any feedback you would give there? Someone want to either give that in the chat or if someone wanted to connect via um, the video side, just uh, recovering what those three foundations are. Have any help from anyone? Anyone who would be able to give us the three foundations or even just one of the three foundations so far? Okay, so um, what I'm recovering about them is that God has spoken and that God has spoken 
secondly, in his word. Um, and that thirdly, then God has given a com- us a commission to communicate that word. So God's speaking and the significance of his speaking, where that stands and the, the, uh, the significance of that for us, God's word and its power, the same power that created the wor- world, the same power that does not return void, the same power in his word that has the effectiveness to change hearts. Okay. The very fact that God has chosen to communicate and speak is a definitive, powerful thing, right? Um, God's speaking by his power, that first step. Second, how he has spoken, he has spoken in written form, which is significant, right? Isn't it? Because it's not, it's not just words that are then gone, but it's words that are recorded words that are available to anyone who reads or anyone who can hear. Okay. Um, And so words that anyone can read and hear means then that those words must be conveyed and they can be conveyed in written form, certainly. And people certainly could read their Bible. So the question of whether someone could just pick up their Bible, read and never hear preaching, Okay, well, that's a real possibility. You could say somebody could do that. Would that be sufficient? Well, no, because of the third foundation. Third foundation being that God has given us a commission and that we then are called to speak and communicate God's words. Okay. Um, but if you put some of this together as he's in the, the direction I'm assuming he's going and as you look through the handout and so forth, you put some of this together and you realize the power, the, the significance, the, uh, the marvel of all of this that God has handed to you and I as we communicate his words a part and a role in the task of his words speaking powerfully in people's lives. I mean, that's a very, it's a very humbling and extraordinary reality right? that God would put into my hands that responsibility. Um, that would be a great honor in that sense, but it would also be then a great responsibility for me to do it well, that I don't just communicate words or ideas that make sense to me, but I communicate his words. And that's going to take us into what we've got coming up on our next lecture. Uh, Our next lecture, Dr. Minnick would be doing a brief overview of hermeneutics. This is Dr. David Minnick, brief overview of hermeneutics. Dr. Kielmeyer, uh, a uh, a overview of communication theory, a philosophy of communication. How do you connect your ideas? Followed by Dr. Mark Minnick, an expository philosophy of preaching. So to link what Dr. McGonigal is doing to what's coming up, what you've got here is a series of steps that are taking us towards through the philosophy and taking us towards the praxis on um, how you actually start to put a sermon together. Um, this is, we can make this link even deeper if we want. The philosophy of preaching that we're making right now, okay, so God has spoken, God has spoken in his word, God calls us to speak his word. If you think about what we're doing in the subsequent lectures, the next lecture is an overview of hermeneutics. So it's a process of understanding what God has said in his word, followed by how to communicate God's word, or communicate ideas and followed by an expository philosophy of preaching. So that's where we're headed. And that directly links to what Dr. McGonigal has been already doing for us. And with that, I will hand it back over to him. Welcome back. Yeah, I'm so sorry about that. My uh, computer totally froze up and uh, I'm not sure where, where I even left off. <laughs> Is the, um, does anybody know where I cut off as far as the content goes? I think we heard you start your third point. Okay. Let me, let me, uh, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out the technology here, but let me try to pull up my uh, PowerPoint. Um, and you would just hit share screen and then you would choose which screen you're sharing. Okay. Can you see the PowerPoint now? Uh, no. So then hit that little b- blue button on the bottom right. It says share screen. Okay. And then it should come up. There you go. Okay.
Looks good. Okay, great, awesome. Okay, so let's uh, kind of go back and uh, recover where we were. Uh, I'm trying to give you three very simple uh, foundations for preaching that uh, I think are, are, are memorable, but they're also very powerful. And, and, and it's probably nothing new in the sense that these are, th these are new theological ideas, but when you put them together in sequence, there's a kind of a cumulative effect. And the first, again, is that God God has spoken. There can be no preaching of the Word of God unless we believe that God has spoken. Um, and there's no doubt, we've seen uh, Genesis chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, that God is truly a, a speaking God. That's one of the things that sets him apart from uh, false gods. And then last, uh, C, because God and his words are inseparable, uh, his words cannot fail. So when we preach God's word, we have this confidence that God will perform his purposes and accomplish his will. <clears throat> uh, and we, we saw that that uh, accomplishment takes place in the realm of salvation. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse uh, 15, that the scriptures are able to make people wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And the scriptures have the capacity, they have the ability to perfect or make uh, complete, mature, the man of God. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse uh, 16. So uh, as, you, as you begin to look at the references, your confidence in the scriptures is heightened. Um, so there are several, uh, I think, significant uh, implications or uh, consequences to what we've talked about. And the first of those is this, that man's response to God's words is man's response to God himself. So you can't separate the two. And that God really does intend for us to um, hear what he has said and to respond positively with, with faith. Um, so when God speaks, man is obligated to hear and obey. And uh, I think this is one thing, this is one uh, consequence that is really encouraging and um, uh, helpful to think about, and that is the authority and power of our preaching ministry lies in the words of God and not in our own words. And that is, that is huge when it comes to our philosophy of preaching, is that our confidence is in the word of God itself and not in ourselves. Because sometimes, you know, when people talk about authoritative preaching, really what they're thinking about is more a style of preaching, a, a manner of preaching. And it may be that the particular speaker has a certain uh, charismatic personality or a flair or a, a strength, you know, maybe, maybe even physically there's a, there's a kind of demeanor that communicates authority and power. And uh, maybe, maybe they even, you know, hit the, hit the pulpit and, and, and bang on it a little bit and yell, you know, put their finger in your face. And, and from our standpoint, you know, we might go away saying, wow, that, that was authoritative preaching, right? That, wow, that guy can really preach. Uh, I've heard my, my daughter say things like that in, the, in, in context where there's a strong presence. You know, wow, that guy really, really knows how to preach. Um, but the question is, is that really the basis for our authority? I mean, is that where our authority resides and that is that where it comes from? Well, I think a biblical philosophy of preaching reminds us that the authority of the preacher goes back ultimately to the word that he preaches. And that's not to say that our delivery and our demeanor has no consequence, but even if you're not the most uh, powerful and, and, and persuasive of public speakers, uh, you can rest knowing that if you say what God said, if you unleash God's word, it has the power uh, to perform God's purposes. And, you know, you just, you just let the lion out of the cage, if you will, and, and let it uh, roar. So the authority and power of preaching lies in the words of God, not our own. In fact, I would, uh, I would rather see a guy that gets up and, and, and maybe isn't the best speaker but he actually says what the Bible says than to have somebody that's, that's really um, good at connecting with an audience and, you know, tells a lot of funny jokes and has good rapport and people laugh and people have a good time. 
But the question is, are they getting the word? Are they actually hearing the Bible? Because the Bible is the source of a preacher's authority and power. And then next, in authentic biblical preaching, preaching the preacher is not the only one speaking. And, and this is, you know, perhaps you've never really thought about this, but in authentic biblical preaching, God is speaking in and through his word. So whenever you preach, whenever you teach the word of God, God is speaking in that moment. Um, and so, you know, sometimes when we come to the end of a service, we'll say things like, if, if God has spoken to you today, and I understand what people are saying when they make comments like that, if God has spoken to you today. But the reality is, if we were preaching the word, and if we said what the Bible says, then God did speak today. And the question is not if God has spoken, but God has spoken, and therefore what is to be our response to what he has said. And then this uh, powerful consequence, the preacher who claims to speak for God must accurately represent God in his speech. Um, he, he has to talk about God as God has spoken about himself. In other words, our obligation, our responsibility is simply to convey clearly and accurately and faithfully what God has said. Um, nobody likes to have his or her speech taken out of context, right? I mean, maybe you've had somebody hear a part of what you said, and then they communicated that to somebody else, but they took it out of the context in which it was originally stated, they didn't understand the context, and so they misconstrued, they misinterpreted, they misused what you said, and in some cases that can be really damaging, right? Uh, none of us likes to be taken out of context. None of us likes to be misrepresented. Um, and I think, you know, as, as teachers or preachers of God's Word, we, ha we have to come to grips with the sobering reality of our responsibility to faithfully, accurately say what God said, and we don't have the right to misconstrue and misinterpret what God has said. And that, you know, that, that's a huge responsibility. It's, it's the kind of weight that, you know, that, that sets on me. Uh, on, on a weekend b before uh, Sunday, when, when, I, when I start to think about the responsibility of standing up in front of a group of people and saying, thus says the Lord. I mean, man, thus says the Lord. I do not want to stand in front of people and say, this is what God has said, when that's really not what God has said. And that's why in some cases we have to be honest and we have to say, you know, it, 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 you know I'm not entirely sure or... Uh, it seems to me that God is saying in this passage, but to get up and dogmatically declare, thus says the Lord, means that we have to understand what God has said. So, theological foundation number one, God has spoken. Uh, theological foundation number two, um, in some instances, God chose to preserve in written form what he chose to speak. So, God is clearly a speaking God. And thankfully for us, he chose in certain instances to actually record, preserve um, what he spoke in written form. And in those instances, I mean, he's, okay, so what? Um, well, it, here's, here are the uh, implications of that. It, in those instances, then God's revelation becomes accessible to later generations um, because it's preserved, because it's recorded. Because it's passed down, now it's accessible to later generations, and it's also relevant to later generations. And uh, here's where I want you to look at a couple of passages that I've got there on the uh, screen. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 12 through 13, and then Romans uh, 15, 1 Corinthians 10, and 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you don't have time to turn there, you can just listen to me read these passages, but you might want to... Uh, uh, put your eyes on these texts and, and see it for yourself. Deuteronomy 31, Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law, 
and that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn. Okay? So there is God's initial revelation to the children of Israel then becomes relevant to their children and so on. Generation after generation after generation, the word which God originally spoke is now passed down and becomes relevant to later generations. Uh, Paul says this uh, very explicitly in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, in earlier times, were written for our learning, for our instruction. You think about that. Um, Whatever was written aforetime in, in previous generations, Paul says, was written for our instruction, present instruction, that we... Speaking of of later generations, um, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, the writings, might have hope. So there's a sense in which God spoke and preserved what he spoke for the benefit of later generations, like you and and like me. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, Paul says, Now all these things happened unto them, that is Israel, for examples— and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So these things happened to Israel in the past. Those historical circumstances and that historical narrative is now written down, preserved, and it actually becomes a source of admonition and instruction for us in the 21st century. I mean, that's powerful when you think about it, isn't it? That... In some instances, God chose to preserve in written form what he chose to speak, and that now, because of that preservation, um, we actually have access to what God has said. And because it's the speech of God, it is forever relevant and it is forever applicable. And I can come to the Bible um, today and benefit from what has been recorded. Uh, think about 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse uh, 15 and 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is what? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Um, the, the writings are profitable. They're relevant for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, righteousness. And, and in this particular instance, uh, Timothy is, is most like Paul and Timothy are most likely thinking of the old uh, covenant revelation, not not the New Testament as we have it today. So e- even the Old Testament is relevant and profitable for these various areas. Okay, so theological foundation number one, what is it? It's it's the Word of God. It's the, the revelation of God. God has spoken. Uh, that That's the first theological foundation. The second one is the inscripturated Word of God, that the Word of God has been uh, put down in writing. That's what Scripture means. Uh, it's been preserved. And then thirdly, you have this natural uh, consequence of those first two pillars, and that is this. Preach that Word that God has spoken and that has been written down. And this is the, um, the focus here is on proclamation. So you have revelation, God has disclosed himself, he's spoken. You have uh, preservation, that what he has spoken has been preserved. And then you have proclamation, that preserved speech of God is now proclaimed. And uh, it's important for us to remind ourselves that the only reason that we're able to speak for God is because God has commissioned us to do so. In other words, it would be kind of... Um, audacious for us to stand up and say, God has said, right? The God of the universe has said when we don't have any authority to speak on his behalf. But the reality is we have been commissioned by God to speak. Um, If we didn't have that commission, what we would do would be presumption to speak for God without his permission. Um, You know, what, what if I, you know, if, if I were to stand up to you today and say, well, you know, I'm here to represent to you the President of the United States. Well, you know, I, I don't have any authority. I'm not in a position to be able to do that. I mean, I can I can say certain things uh, in, in reference to the President or the government, but I don't have the authority, I don't have the authorization to do that. 
but as preachers, as, as God ordained preachers, we have been commissioned to speak for God. In fact, God told his servants to speak what he had spoken. Uh, look at Exodus chapter four. I think uh, some of these uh, passages are actually on your handout. I've tried to put in boldface uh, type some of the important sections there. But God spoke, and as part of his speech, he told his servants to speak what he had spoken. Uh, look at Exodus four ten. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Maybe uh, some of you feel that way uh, about uh, the ministry of the word. And the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Verse 12. Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. So Moses is going to serve as a representative of God. And God is going to give him the words to speak. And uh, verse 13 Oh, my Lord, send, I pray thee by the hand of, uh, he said, Oh, my Lord, send, I pray thee by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Le uh, Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman. In other words, he's going to be the one um, uh, speaking for you unto the people. And he shall be, even he shall be to thee as a mouth, and thou shalt be to him as God. <laughs> wow, that's, that's, that's powerful, right? Thou shalt be to him as God, as God's very words. So, uh, did, you, did you follow the, the process here? God spoke to Moses. Moses, in turn, speaks to Aaron, who in turn speaks to the people. But what's happening is Moses is relaying the words of God to Aaron, and Aaron is relaying the words of God to the people. But it's still the faithful communication the faithful transmission of what God has said. Um, and when Moses spoke to Aaron, look at the end of verse 16 there. It says he spoke as God. He spoke as God's words. Moses was to say to Aaron exactly what God told him to say. And that really becomes foundational to our understanding of the nature of biblical preaching. Our responsibility, our obligation, um, our authorization is to say what God has said. Um, Thus says the Lord. Uh, look at Mark chapter 3, verse 14 there in your handout. Jesus ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to do what? To preach, right? So they had authorization. They were commissioned to speak uh, to preach in this case. Matthew chapter 28, next passage, verses 18 through 20, uh, the Great Commission passage. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So it's Jesus. It's Jesus' words and Jesus' commands that we are teaching to the nations that becomes uh, instrumental in the discipleship of people. In other words, so here's Jesus, and he has the authority. He has all authority and, and sovereignty, and he has commanded certain things. And we, our responsibility is not to come up with our own ideas and our own notions or, and, and communicate our own opinions and our own feelings. Our responsibility is to take what Jesus has commanded and transmit that faithfully and accurately to the world. And then look at Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, where Paul says, And the things you have heard of me among many witnesses... Those same things commit or entrust to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. I mean, there it is again, right? 
So here's Paul, and here's the apostolic word that he's speaking, and he's, he's committing that, he's entrusting that to certain faithful individuals who are to take what Paul has said, which came ultimately from Christ, and, he, and they are to faithfully relay that same message down from generation to generation. Uh, it's really a beautiful process. Uh, and, and we want to make sure, obviously, that as, as we stand in the line of that word coming down to future generations, that, that we are not somehow muffling the signal, that we're not in some way distorting what was originally spoken. You know, because I'm sure you've seen maybe the children's game where um, someone will start, you know, the, the you know, you have a bunch of kids in a line, and then the first person says something, and then they're all supposed to pass that down until it gets to the very end. And when it gets to the end, you try to find out, okay, does the last person actually say anything close to what the first person said? Um, well, unfortunately, uh, sometimes what God says over here in the scriptures it is not accurately transmitted and relayed down to subsequent generations because there's been all kinds of distortion there's been all kinds of mis mishearing and, and miscommunication going on and um god told his servants to speak what he had spoken that is i mean that that's the thing that drives me as a preacher the one thing that i've got to do you know, I mean, when it comes to my outline, when it comes to, you know, my organization, I have concerns about that. I try to make it as, as, as helpful and communicate as, as effectively as possible. But the one non-negotiable, the one thing that I have to be adamant about is this, that I must say what God said. There's absolutely no room to, to, to um, ne negotiate that or, or to, um, to fudge in that area. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, again, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing, um, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and so on. So it's the word. Uh, it's the word that we are to preach, and the word has already been given to us. So we as preachers, we don't manufacture a message. Um, it's like, it's like uh, Peter says, you know, we, we didn't come to you with cleverly devised or constructed fables or stories. What we came to you, what we came to you as eyewitnesses of actually what happened and what was spoken. And we didn't construct this or craft this uh, just out of our own brains. We're saying to you what happened and what God, what God has said. And then 1 John, you see 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Um, again, I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to pile up the references and the examples biblically because the, 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 this first lecture really is a biblical philosophy of preaching. And so what does scripture say about this matter of speaking on behalf of God? Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and notice John says, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. So what we saw and what we heard, that's exactly what we're declaring and preaching to you. So that you might have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you. Okay, so John is an eyewitness, sees certain things, he hears certain things, and that's exactly what he declares to us in the written, uh, written word in epistles like First John. And now our responsibility is to take that, that written word and say what John saw and what John said, because what John saw and said is eyewitness testimony and is given to him by the Holy Spirit. And then I love this, uh, the last book of our New Testament, Revelation chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 3. I mean, look at the way this book, this last book of your New Testament begins. The revelation, the, the apocalypse, the unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, that is Jesus Christ, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. 
And Jesus Christ sent and communicated it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record, <laughs> who testified to the word of God. So you've got, you've got God relaying, God the Father relaying to Jesus Christ certain things. Jesus Christ communicating that by his angel to John, and then John bearing witness and bearing record to us through the book we call Revelation. Okay? Did, did you follow the process? Did you, did you see that? God, Jesus Christ, angel, John, us. And, but, but when it comes to us, it's ultimately the, it's the word of God. And so that becomes a paradigm. It becomes a pattern. It becomes an example of what it looks like to be an authorized, commissioned spokesperson for Jesus Christ and the gospel. It's that our, our responsibility, our obligations to stand up and say, thus says the Lord. So um, what are the uh, three theological foundations for preaching? Remember these? Okay, so I, I, want, I want these to be simple enough that you can actually um, kind of package them up and uh, tote them around with you. And when you prepare to teach God's word or preach God's word, these things can kind of come with you. In that, uh, in that thinking. The first is God has revealed himself. He's spoken. He's a speaking God. And uh, without that, there would be no preaching of the word of God. Secondly, that word has been preserved. It's been recorded. It's been inscripturated for later generations so that it now becomes accessible to us and it becomes relevant. And then thirdly, we have the obligation, the responsibility, and the huge privilege and delight of speaking what God has spoken and preserved. We proclaim the word. We say what God has said. And as we do so, again, we have the confidence that God is going to accomplish his purposes through the word. Uh, so I don't know if there are any um, questions that, that you all have that you want to um, ask at this point. I will see if I can um, figure out here how to... I guess that would come through the chat. Well, chat let's feature. do this. Uh, typically what we've done, we go for the first hour and then we'll take a break for five minutes. Okay. Um, why don't we take a five minute break? And then actually Dr. McGonagall, I have, I'm sit, I, I have a list of questions here. Um, I feel like we have the opportunity, we have you here and we want okay, to pick your sure. brain. So <laughs> I'll, I'll shoot something over to you during this break. And if you want to kind of glance through those questions, but then okay. Everyone else as well, if you've got specific questions you want to ask, this is the time. Um, you've got somebody here who is thinking about preaching, you know, just every week and working with this on an academic level. So this is really an excellent time to throw your questions there, get, the, get, get some thoughts and, and fill out some ideas for you there. Okay, let's take a five minute break. I have three minutes after the hour. We'll come back at eight minutes after the hour and um, we'll talk talk further then. Okay. So eight minutes after the hour, we'll continue and go on from there. Okay, Dr. McGonigal, if you're ready, uh, we'll continue on. I see here on the screen, it'll take some time looking um, at another discussion. And then as we have time, I have Written, I read out five questions. It's probably way too much. Um, so if we get to those, we get to those. If we don't, we don't. And if you have questions as well, just it helps me to think actively as I'm, as I'm listening through content to be asking questions um, because that's causing my mind to really be active and inter interact with what's happening there. So if you have questions, uh, grab those and, and hopefully we can have some time. We'll see uh, to discuss some of those things as well. Okay. I will hand it over or back over to you and uh, we'll look forward to what you have for us. Okay, great. Um, I think because of time, I'm going to, I'm going to skip over that second section there on the uh, nature and priority of biblical preaching. And I'll send Dr. Arnold the notes for that. And then if you want uh, just to relay that to the class, uh, they, they would have the material. Cause so I think some of that it, it's, it's a good, uh, foundation, but some of that's going to say a lot of what we just said. So what I'd like to talk about in the last hour here is um, our intent of preaching. 
uh, what we're intending to do, what we're intending to accomplish in the preaching of God's Word. So this is a little bit more the uh, philosophy of preaching. So the first part was a biblical theology of preaching based on those three pillars. And this is a little bit more of a philosophy of preaching that really uh, it covers a number of different areas, but I, but I think some really important things that we need to, to talk about. All right, so let's uh, begin here. And these, these um, there are 15 of these, and these are on your notes um, in the handout. Again, af it's after the uh, nature and priority of biblical preaching. <clears throat> Trying to figure out how I can, um, I guess I can't see the, um, the uh, display. Okay. So the, f the first thing here is, um, as preachers of the gospel, I think we want to be intent on making an impression, not simply imparting information. Um, and uh, trying to, yeah. The uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who has written an excellent book on preaching, on preaching and preachers, uh, and who was a well-known British expositor, uh, pastor in the uh, London area, said that the first and primary object of preaching is to produce an impression. It is not primarily to impart information. Uh, and, that, and that may seem um, counterintuitive at first, but... Um, what, what are we trying to accomplish? Is it just the relaying of biblical information, biblical data, or is it actually to convey something of God in the preaching of his word? Remember we talked about one of the foundations is that you can't separate God from his word. And so, so you know, sometimes as preachers, we come to this task academically and, and intellectually and so we're just opening up the scriptures kind of uh, from an educational standpoint, but we're really not, we're really missing something I think that's really valuable. And that is the conveying of the presence and the power of God in that preaching. Uh, it was um, Jonathan Edwards who said that the main benefit obtained by preaching is by impression made upon the mind at the time and not by an effect that arises afterwards. Um, so that's not to say that it's not important to convey information. Obviously, that's at the heart. We, we've already talked about that. Our responsibility as preachers is to preach the word, to say what God said. And that's going to require us preaching the text of Scripture, explaining what the text of Scripture means, but... But behind that, our intention, I call this the intent of preaching, because behind that, our intention is to bring that word from God, that information to people in a way that they actually experience and encounter God in the ministry of the word. And, and that's a whole different dimension. So we can't content ourselves with just um, being distributors of, of um, information. So... So this, philosophically, I'm always asking this question, why am I giving people this information? Um, what effect or impact do I hope it will have on the way they think, on the way they feel, and on the way they act? Um, what's, what's driving me in saying this? Is it, is it simply to provide more information for the head, or do I have additional concerns to actually go for the heart to actually impact people in their affections, the way they feel about truth, the way they feel about God, the way they feel about their responsibilities, the way they feel about sin, and then consequently the way that they live in light of that. So, number one, be intent on making an impression, not simply imparting information. Now, let me just clarify, the impression here is not being impressed with me. So there's a sense in which I could say preaching should be impressive but it's not people being impressed with me or my style or my, you know, uh, abilities or my skill. I want them to be impressed with God. I want them to come away having seen him and experienced him through the word. Uh, secondly, <clears throat> I think philosophically, when it comes to preaching, we want to be intent on conveying a, a superlative sense of God's glory. So this is kind of building off of the, 
the first intention. <clears throat> but specifically, I want to relay and convey this great sense of the glory of God. Um, what do I tend to highlight and magnify in my preaching? Um, what, what is it that becomes my, my favorite theme? Um, you know, what's my go-to topic and my go-to emphasis? And what is one of my great achievements as a preacher? Um, it was said by uh, John Carrick, I hope this uh, quotation's on here, yeah, uh, that the grandeur of God was a favorite theme of Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was a religious uh, philosopher, preacher, associated with the Great Awakening, the revival in America. Um, what contributes to the sense of the greatness, the grandeur, and the sheer magnificence of God uh, is Edwards' striking use of adjectives, indeed his unashamed use of superlatives, as he seeks to portray through the limits of our language, the glory of that great being, which is ultimately incomprehensible and indescribable. So, I mean, the point is, there's a lot of big words there, but the point is that Edwards was known for and was endeavoring through the limits of our language to convey just how glorious and just how great and just how magnificent God is. And, and that really, you know, for me, theologically and philosophically, that needs to be one of those driving purposes for preaching. Again, not just a, a, an academic explanation of the text, not just a, a dry exposition of a passage of scripture, talking about its history and its background. I mean, all of those things are important. All of those things are foundational. But I want to go beyond that to actually cause people to see God in his glory and his beauty and his magnificence and his majesty and his supremacy. And Jonathan Edwards was known for that kind of preaching. So again, going back to the previous set of questions, what do I tend to highlight and magnify in my preaching? You know, is it just the, the meaning of original language terms or defining terms in a passage? Uh, you know, what's my favorite theme? What's my favorite emphasis? You know, and, and like when, when it comes to the end of your ministry, somebody says, what's one of your great achievements as a preacher? Uh, I want them. I want them to be able to say that he made much of God, that he worked hard, really hard, within the confines of his own limitations and the limitations of language to set before us the glory of God. So, number two, intent on conveying a superlative sense of the glory of God. And again, this is one of Edwards's great achievements as a preacher: his ability to convey to his hearers a sense of God. Um, that's what I want in my preaching. And I think that's, that's um, consistent with the, the role of, of the preacher, to say what God said in a way that people actually experience the sender in that communication. What are people ultimately and primarily impressed with as a result of your preaching? I mean, that, that's one of those questions that's just really convicting and really sobering to think about. What are people ultimately and primarily impressed with as a result of your preaching? So if you were to ask somebody after you teach or preach God's word, okay, what, you know, what was the big impression? Uh, what, you know, what's the takeaway? Um, what are they leaving with? And again, I think what we want to shoot for ultimately pray to this end is that God would give us the capacity by his grace and by his spirit to convey a superlative sense of God. Specifically, uh, I would say this. I think number three is important because it's a little bit of a further uh, nuancing or a narrowing of that idea. It's not just God in general, but Jesus Christ in particular. We are intent on producing in people a, a reveling in Jesus Christ. A reveling in Jesus Christ. Because really, you know, if you, if you revel in something, um, you really delight in it. You, you cherish it. Um, I don't know what it is that you that you really delight in and, and cherish and hold dear. Maybe it's maybe it's uh, family members or maybe it's something that was given to you by someone special. But um, you you hold that thing dear and you cherish it. And and I think 
you know, ultimately in the preaching of the word, okay, remember, you know, Paul says in 2 Timothy 4 to preach the word, but when you look at the word and what it reveals, it's primarily focusing our attention again and again and again consistently across the board to a person, Jesus the Messiah. So it's not just doctrinal uh, revelation. It's not just propositional truths that God has given us to convey to people. He's given us the person of Jesus Christ to put on display in a way that causes people to actually revel and cherish Jesus, to, to love him more. And, and again, I think these are key philosophical kinds of things because, you know, you're going to continue in this class and, and talk about some of the specifics of interpreting a passage of Scripture and laying that passage of Scripture out uh, in ways that are helpful for your audience, and all of that's good. But don't, in the process, don't miss the, the privilege that we have, the opportunity that we have to set Jesus Christ on display from the word that we preach. Um, <clears throat> let me just uh, share with you a little, uh, a uh, little uh, uh, incident that I think um, was is is somewhat um, humorous, but it also is also very powerful. Um, there were a group of American Christians in the 19th century who planned to visit London for a week. And their friends, um, excited for the opportunity, encouraged them to go hear two of London's most famous preachers at the time and to bring back a report on their impressions based on the preaching that they heard. And so on Sunday morning after their arrival, the Americans attended Joseph Parker's church and they discovered um, that his reputation for being very eloquent and, and very ornate in his speech was, was well-deserved, that he really was a powerful uh, speaker. And one of the people exclaimed after the service, after hearing Parker preach, I do declare it must be said, for there is no doubt that Joseph Parker is the greatest preacher there ever was. And uh, in fact, so much so that the group actually wanted to go back and hear Parker in the evening, but uh, they remembered that their friends uh, told them they should go hear Charles Spurgeon as well. So on Sunday evening, they went to the Metropolitan Tabernacle where they heard Spurgeon was preaching. And um, they really weren't, I don't think, prepared for what they were going to hear. And after Spurgeon preached, one of the members of the group said, I do declare, it must be said, for there is no doubt that Jesus Christ is the greatest Savior that ever there was. Okay. Do you see the difference? Uh, there's a remarkable difference, and it's a, it's a sobering difference. In my ministry of the Word, I don't want people in any way to be impressed with me or my style or my, you know, the, the way I deliver the content. I, I want all of that to be subordinate to and used for the ultimate purpose of magnifying Jesus Christ so that people come to revel and cherish and delight in him. He's the greatest savior there ever was. That's the intention that I have in my preaching to uh, produce in people a reveling in Jesus Christ. Number four. Um, Related to number three, that we should be intent on being known for preaching Christ, that that should be one of our goals and one of our ambitions. Again, not, not just to be a super good explainer of Scripture, but in the explanation of Scripture, to be really good at making Christ known. <clears throat> um, this is our ambition. One of the um, books that I read talked about, um, it actually it was, uh, it was an audio interview with uh, Sinclair Ferguson, and, uh, who's written a lot of good things about preaching and who himself is a good, good preacher. But uh, he raises a really important question in, in this address that he gives called Preaching Christ in All the Scriptures, and that is, what's the one thing that you want to be known for as a preacher? Uh, or, or maybe in reality, what are you known for as a preacher? And um, he relates the story of another American preacher named Alistair Begg, 
who um, came to the United States to uh, pastor a church, and he was uh, playing golf with somebody, uh, some, another pastor, another minister. And uh, they were there, you know, they're playing on the golf course. And uh, at one point, the, this other pastor turned to Alistair Begg and said to him, so Alistair, what's your thing? Um, you know, what, what's, your, what's your thing? And, um, you know, before Alistair had come to the United States, he had really never been asked that question. He's trying to figure out what he means by what, what's, what's your thing? And what the pastor was trying to indicate, what's your distinctive? Like, like what's your style? What, what makes you, uh, you know, what sets you apart as a pastor? And, um, you know, what's your special emphasis? Um, and, and typically preachers tend to have something that, that becomes their special emphasis, their special soapbox, their special um, unique um, way of, of, of highlighting something within church ministry or something doctrinally. And, um, and uh, Sinclair Ferguson's point is that really when it comes down to it, if, if somebody says, what's your thing as a pastor, as a preacher, I, I, I want the answer to that to be the preaching of Jesus Christ. That's my thing. Uh, not, not all of these peripheral um, things, tangential things that, that people get sidetracked on. But I want to be known as a preacher of Jesus Christ. That's, that's my thing. And um, Ferguson says that it ought to be possible to say of every gospel minister, and especially those gospel ministers that we most admire, that the thing that is manifestly absolutely at the core and center of their ministry that makes it apostolic is that you can never, sitting under that ministry, you can never escape the centrality of Jesus Christ. So going back to our three pillars, um, preaching the word is not just preaching. Uh, it's preaching the inscripturated word, but it's also preaching the incarnate word to, to which the inscripturated word points. So if somebody says, what's your thing? Uh, I hope we can answer that question by saying my thing my distinctive, my special emphasis, the thing that I want to be known for in ministry is preaching Jesus Christ in ways that cause people to experience him and to cherish him. Ferguson says, this ministry is Christ-centered, it's Christ-dominated, it's Christ-full, and if anything else, and this might be well the secret, this minister is Christ-intoxicated. So really filled up and full with the person and work of Jesus Christ, and that that relationship that we have with Jesus Christ then is going to come through. It's going to permeate our messages, not just the content, but our intention in preaching the word. Um, it must never be forgotten. This is what Charles um, Bridges says in the uh, classic work, The Christian Ministry, uh, which I would highly recommend to you. But he says, it must never be forgotten that there is but one mode of preaching that God has promised to bless, and that is when all our sermons are made to set forth and magnify Christ the Lord. So if you're talking about, you know, what, what's the one method that God has, has promised to bless? There are lots of methods of preaching and, you know, ways of going about it. But, but the one thing that is God's design for us in preaching the word is to magnify his son, the Lord Jesus. Uh, number five, related to this, as a, as a consequence of this, I want to be intent on not exalting myself. <clears throat> not exalting myself. Um, let me just go ahead and, and uh, convey to you the, uh, oh, I'm looking for the um, notes here for this uh, quotation. But the basic point was, in some cases, we actually end up preaching uh, for our own ego rather than for the needs of the people. And so we always have to fight against this, this danger, this tendency to parade our academic knowledge, our understanding of Scripture, uh, whatever it is, we, there's this tendency to want to put that on display 
and to feel like our preaching needs to be filled up with things that people would be impressed with, whether it's facts from history or uh, our knowledge of the original languages like Greek and Hebrew. And, and sometimes if we're not careful, we're motivated actually by our own ego, by our own selves and by our own reputation, really than the needs of the people. And so one of the things that we have to step back and ask ourselves philosophically when it comes to preaching is, why am I saying what I'm saying? Not only do I want to exalt Jesus Christ and, and give people a sense of his, uh, God's glory and excellence, but I want to make sure that, that people are actually being ministered to and their needs are being met and they're actually being edified. And it's not just about me, um, because you see here exegesis or the, the process of um, – arriving at an understanding of the meaning of a biblical text is is the scaffolding of the building uh, but it's not the building itself it's it's the foundation for what we say this whole process of uh, interacting with the um, biblical text and studying the historical context and the literary context all of that is wonderful all of it needs to be done but it's but it's along the way to this this greater purpose that we have in uh, magnifying Christ and building up others. Number six, um, as far as intention, let me encourage you to be intent on preaching Christ for the pleasure of God, for the smile of God. I love this um, this, this passage in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, where Paul says that we are an aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. See that? We are an aroma of Christ to God. Uh, in other words, here's, here's how one uh, commentator describes those words of Paul in 2, Timothy, uh, 2 Corinthians 2. Irrespective of the human response to the gospel, you see there's some that are being saved and there are some that are perishing. It's, it's the proclamation of Christ. It's the proclamation of God. Uh, excuse me. It's the proclamation of Christ that delights the heart of God because it centers on the Son that he loves. We are an aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those. So regardless of the response to the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel is a fragrant aroma to God because it centers on the Son whom he loves. And so we content ourselves as preachers to preach Christ. Um, and, and though our desire is for people to be saved and respond positively and favorably, you know, as well as I know, that that doesn't always happen. But at, at the back of my mind, I think to myself, regardless of how people respond, I'm going to preach Christ because it's to the glory of God and it's the pleasure of God that I, that I uh, aim at. It's like Martin Lloyd-Jones once said to me, there's nothing more terrible for a preacher to be in the pulpit alone without the conscious uh, smile of God. And um, nothing brings that smile quite so uh, clearly as, um, let me back up here, as, as the uh, preaching of Jesus Christ. In fact, I had a, I had a friend who... Um, in fact, Joel knows him, uh, Dr. Uh, Arnold and, and Dr. Oberlin both know this uh, gentleman. He's a church planner, and he preached on this passage at our church. And he, uh, he's, as a church planner, he was anticipating going into an area and preaching the gospel, and you never know how people are going to respond. In fact, you don't even know if anybody's going to show up on a Sunday. So you come prepared to preach, and, you know, there may be nobody there. And I remember him saying it, it just it stuck with me that he said that that even if nobody showed up to the service, that he was going to preach the sermon that he had prepared, and he was going to preach Christ because if for nothing else, it was a fragrant aroma to God, that he was going to preach all by himself to the glory of God. <laughs> I love that. Um, that is our ultimate object, uh, 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 objective. That's, that's good. <clears throat> Number seven. We are intent or should be intent on awakening God-honoring emotions. God-honoring emotions. 
have the emotions been stirred by the truth of God revealed in Scripture? Because, you know, what's the difference between preaching that, you know, that, 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 that works the crowd, that, that gets people kind of stirred up, that manufactures some kind of hype and, and energy and, 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 and um, people are, are really engaged versus preaching that awakens God honoring emotions so that it's not just an issue of the head, but it's also preaching that affects the heart. Um, have the emotions been stirred by the truth of God revealed in Scripture? I think, I think that's, that's the key. So as preachers, we want to take people as high and as far as the, the text will allow them to go. In other words, it's not... It's not the kind of emotion that is just worked up through stories and, and, and through manipulation of people's psychology or feelings. It's actually helping them see what is being said in the text and then helping them feel what they should feel based on the truth in the text. And, and, and this, is, this is, I think, sometimes in, in teaching preachers and in helping young men prepare for ministry, this is something I see that's lacking. Uh, there's the ability to explain a passage of scripture and to get into different aspects of the text, but but when it comes down to the emotional component, there's there's this huge uh, missing element of of affections and, and and our feelings being stirred by what we're looking at, so that we're actually moved in our hearts by the truth. And I love again, if I could go back to uh, Jonathan Edwards here. I think I think the way that he puts it here is really helpful for us to think about as preachers, and that is, I consider it my duty to raise the affections, to raise the emotions of my hearers as high as possibly, as high as I possibly can, provided I raise them with nothing but the truth, and in proportion to the truth. Right. So, the truth is the basis for how I feel. And, and I want to take people in proportion to that truth as far as possible. So whether it's glorying in the, the, the majesty and the supremacy of Jesus Christ or his beautiful self-sacrifice and his humility or a passage like John 13 where he takes a towel and he, 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 he washes his disciples' feet, I want as much as possible to enter into the feeling and the sentiment and the emotion of that narrative so that, so that we're not just um, head-only Christians, only affected intellectually and not moved in our hearts by what we're seeing in the Scriptures. Number, um, oh, sorry, there was one more here. Um, John Piper said that preaching this stuff to ourselves um, so that we are moved is going to be the key to whether people are awakened to that truth. Um, because if I preach like what I'm saying is of modest importance, that's what they're going to think. That's what they're going to feel. And so I, I tell my uh, preaching students all the time that you've got to let this truth from the text move you. You've, you've got to let it impact you. You've got to let it uh, get into the fiber of your spiritual being. Because if, if you get up and even say, you know, what the text says, that, that's great. I mean, our obligation is to convey what God has said. But there's also this additional component that we don't want to, we don't want to miscommunicate the importance of what we're saying. We, we can say what God said, but, but fail to really communicate the significance of what we're saying by our manner, by our method, by our mode of communication, by our spirit. Uh, we need to be moved by the truth. And if we're moved by the truth, then we'll help our people feel the way that they should feel. <clears throat> Number eight, um, related to this, being moved by the text emotionally and um, having our own hearts engaged is this idea of it, uh, is that we should be intent in preaching on worshiping our way through the sermon. Worshiping our way through the sermon, that preaching itself becomes for us an act of worship. It's not just a duty of, of conveying information, but of actually worshiping God through our ministry of the Word. Uh, Paul Tripp says that there's, there's an underplayed devotional aspect of preaching. And one of the most powerful things is when 
when your people get to watch you worship your way through your sermon. I love the way that he puts that because it reminds me that, that you know, when I'm, when I'm preaching, I'm actually doing this to the glory of God and for the pleasure of God and preaching the Christ that I love and I'm, I'm worshiping. And if we do that, we allow people to enter into that experience as well. It's kind of like when you, um, if you hear somebody singing, uh, maybe, maybe somebody sings in a church context and, you know, they're, they, they don't have the ability, they, they have sincerity, but they don't have the ability to really sing well. And so maybe it's a song that, that you like and the text is very powerful and you kind of want to enter into it, but the person who's singing doesn't really have the ability to, to take you there, right? And so you, you kind of miss the effect of the song because of that person's inability. And I, I, don't, I don't want people uh, to fail to worship Christ and worship God in a service because, because I'm not there. People typically are only going to go as far as you have gone or as far as you, you can take them, right? And so we want to make sure that we're preaching Christ and loving Christ and worshiping Christ in our proclamation of Christ. Um, Paul Tripp says later that preaching is more than regurgitating your favorite exegetical commentary or recasting sermons of your favorite preachers or reshaping notes from one of your favorite seminary classes. It's the, it's the bringing of the transforming truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ from a passage that has been properly understood. So again, this isn't all about just, you know, a, a devotional kind of preaching that just allows us to say what, what is on our hearts and, you know, how we feel. It really is from a passage, and that passage has been properly understood through exegesis and pro- appropriate hermeneutics. Uh, cogently and practically applied and delivered with the engaging tenderness and passion of a person who has, who has um, been restored by the very truths that he now stands to communicate. You simply cannot do this without proper preparation, meditation, confession, and worship. So um, I don't know what you'll get in terms of, you know, in this course as far as the steps of preparing a sermon but, but don't forget that, that worship needs to be part of that preparation, and it needs to be part of the actual uh, delivery as well. All right, so what is our intent in preaching? What is our philosophy of preaching? Uh, we should be intent on expounding the word as people who have experienced the word. So again, I'm saying uh, in some cases the same thing, but just from a different angle uh, so that we really capture this. We should be intent on expounding and explaining the word as those who have experienced the word. So we're preaching. In other words, we're preaching as witnesses. We're preaching um, something that we ourselves have experienced. <clears throat> and I think that's, uh, that's, that's a, powerful, um, a powerful way of, of communicating. John Stott, who has written a book called um, between two worlds, which is a really good uh, kind of a classic work in the field of homiletics or preaching, says in our preaching we do not uh, just expound words which have been committed uh, to our stewardship, nor do we only proclaim as heralds a mighty deed of redemption which has been done, but in addition, so in addition, he's not saying those that's wrong, but in addition we expound these words and proclaim these deeds as witnesses, as those who have come to a vital experience of this word and deed of God. So we're not we're not just you know oh yeah I've been given this message and I'm just relaying it on to you, um, and oh here's something that's happened in the past and I'm telling you what has happened. I'm actually telling you these things because I personally have been affected. I personally have believed. I personally have experienced salvation and redemption. There's this personal aspect, and you see that in in the um, gospel writers. You see that in John's writings, that which we have seen and heard and, and uh, touched and handled, declare we unto you. I'm an eyewitness of these things, and there's power to that kind of preaching. <clears throat> Number 10, philosophically, we should be intent on making the Bible clear but not dumbing down the Bible. Intent on making the Bible clear, but not dumbing down the Bible. 
again, if I could go back to Martin Lloyd Jones, um, whose whose ministry I think was characterized by the things that I'm talking about here, a, a, a reverent, uh, careful analysis of the biblical text, but a passionate preaching of Christ for the glory of God, a, a doxological focus in his ministry. He said, our business is to teach people the meaning of, of terms that um, are in the Bible, but nevertheless may not be part of the common, you know, uh, normal usage of people. In other words, there, there are things in Scripture that we need to introduce people to, and we can't just ignore them because they may not be the most... Um, you know, scintillating, they may not be the most interesting on the surface. We can't ignore the meaning of those things because it's part of what God has revealed to us. Our obligation and responsibility as preachers is to say what God said, even if we don't feel like what God has said is somehow immediately relevant or would be the most um, well-received. Our responsibility is to preach the whole counsel of God. We don't decide and determine what is to be preached and how. Uh, it is we that have the revelation, the message, and it's our responsibility to make that understood. So we don't ignore certain parts of the revelation of God, but in our effort to explain terms like propitiation or explain terms like redemption, we try to help people understand it. So we try to make it clear, and we may use illustrations and, and try to simplify it in that sense, but we're not dumbing the Bible down in the sense of ignoring or kind of jumping over parts of it that are difficult, like like uh, the author of Hebrews. <laughs> and uh, some of the arguments that he makes in that letter are very, very difficult, but we've got to interact with it. We've got to try to help our people understand it. And, and that means that we've got to do the hard, rigorous mental work and, and study and prayer and meditation beforehand so that we can communicate what God is saying in ways that are accessible and uh, helpful to people. Number 11 related to that is uh, our intention, our purpose, our goal is to give the text of Scripture a voice and not to give it a makeover, not to, not to reshape it and refashion it so that it doesn't look like uh, the original. Uh, Jason Meyer, who wrote a book called Preaching, I think I saw Dr. Arnold has that on your bibliography for this course, um, he has some good thoughts on the need for preachers to rely on the power of the word, which is what we were talking about earlier. The word has the power, the word has the authority, and not relying on our own artistry or our own personality. Uh, he talks about the fact that many, many good books that have been written, classic works, have been uh, abused by people who make movies and films because they've, they've taken what's called artistic license with those, with those books. And so you watch the film or you watch the movie and it doesn't look anything like the original book. They've actually done violence to that original. And um, we, we don't have the liberty as, as heralds, as preachers of God's word to take this art, to, to, to engage in artistic license with the text of scripture. It's simply our responsibility to give it a voice, to to let it let it loose and let it let it free. Um, many efforts, he says, to preach boil down to man-centered attempts to do something in the flesh that only God can do by His Spirit. Preachers must put their faith in the power of God's Word, not in their ability to make something drab into something attractive and appealing. So I'm not you know I'm not taking something that's um, not interesting related to the life of Jesus or the person of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm actually trying to show people how beautiful and how glorious and how compelling it really is uh, at, at, at that level. All right, number 12. Um, got a few more of these. Intent on getting the point of the passage. Because our obligation and role as biblical preachers is to say what God has said, our intention should be to get the point of the past to say what each passage says, and that becomes our driving uh, focus and, and motivation. I heard uh, John MacArthur, who has written a number of uh, commentaries, uh, has preached expositionally for years and years in a church in California. <clears throat> he uh, related an experience that he had during his seminary days, 
one of his professors was the uh, scholar Charles Feinberg. And if you uh, look at some commentaries in the Old Testament, you'll see uh, Feinberg, Feinberg's name cropping up. But uh, Feinberg was his professor. And uh, MacArthur says that he preached his first year in seminary and chapel before the whole student body. And his professor, Feinberg, chose the text. So he gave John MacArthur 2 Samuel chapter 7, which is, which is the great Davidic uh, promise. And he says, MacArthur says that he preached a message on presuming on God. You know, he says, Nathan said, go build it. God said, Nathan, I don't want uh, him to do it. He's a man of blood and so forth. And I preached on presuming on God, which was like a massive missing of the point. Because the, the point was the Davidic covenant, not presuming on God. In other words, he says what he preached on was actually trivial compared to the point of the passage. So he says, when I finished, Feinberg gave me a sheet and he wrote in red, you missed the entire point of the passage. See me in my office. <laughs> and I went into the office. And I'm telling you, he shredded me as only he could. And, you know, that was the greatest lesson I ever learned, to get the point of the passage. And he's like, and that, that's all we're asking out of you, is to get the point of the passage. We don't want your creativity. We don't want your artistic license. We want the point of the passage. We want to say what God said. Number 13, um, we're intent then, because of that, on getting ourself out of the interpretation and into the proclamation. And this kind of connects uh, several things that I said earlier. Um, our intention is, when it comes to understanding a text of Scripture, we don't want to read into Scripture something that it doesn't say. We don't want to bring our own ideas and thoughts into the Bible and, and actually then misshape and, and uh misform uh, uh, what scripture says. Uh, but when it comes, so I want to get out of the interpretation. I want to let the passage say what it says. But then when it comes to my proclamation, when it comes to my preaching of that word, okay, I got the point of the passage. Now I'm all in. I'm all in to conveying the message of the word and preaching Jesus Christ. So if you can think of it this way, get, get yourself out of the interpretation um, and, and again, this is something that, that John MacArthur has uh, communicated uh, many times. Get, get yourself out of the interpretation, but then get yourself fully into, fully engaged into the delivery and the, and the proclamation. <clears throat> uh, number 14. I'm also intent on preaching that encourages uh, unity. Preaching that encourages unity. And I think if we preach Christ and if we preach the cross, that will be the effect of our preaching. Um, Paul, Paul was not uh, given to preaching with uh, eloquence, with words of eloquent wisdom, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And, and why not? Because he says, lest, lest the cross of Christ be uh, nullified of its power lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So it's not about me and my eloquence or oratory or, or ability to communicate. Uh, it's the cross that I preach. It's the cross that I highlight and emphasize. And Leon Morris, in talking about this passage, commentator says, preaching with words of eloquent wisdom would draw people to the preacher. It would nullify the cross of Christ. The faithful preaching of the cross leads people to put their trust not in any human device, but in what God has done in Christ. A reliance on rhetoric, the ability to communicate and persuade with words would cause trust in men, the very opposite of what the preaching of the cross is meant to affect. So if you preach Christ, if you preach him faithfully, if you preach him consistently, um, we will avoid these personality cults, the very thing that you see problematic in the church at Corinth, because it gets people away from focusing on the, the communicator, the person, the, the, the preacher himself, and the message that he preaches, Jesus Christ. So one of the intentions that I have behind magnifying Christ is to promote unity, because now the unity is in him and not in a particular spokesperson or in a particular style. 
Um, am I more concerned about how I preach than what I preach? In other words, the, the message of the cross needs to be center and, and, and the substance of my ministry of the word. Am I preaching in such a way that encourages people to follow me or to follow Christ, right? And, and you can, you know, step back and assess your preaching and your teaching ministry and say, are people more connected to me or, or encouraged to follow me and my thinking and my doctrines and, and my uh, particular take on things? Or am I preaching and teaching in such a way that people are actually encouraged to follow Jesus? And then lastly, I'm intent on not dictating the consciences of people in every sphere of life. And this is related to that previous one. Um, I am preaching the word, but I'm not preaching my own opinions. I am preaching the word with the intention of applying it specifically to people's lives and bringing the truth to bear with conviction on people's lives. But I've got to be careful, again, to get myself out of this in the sense of um, forcing my own viewpoints and forcing my own um, personal preferences on everybody through my preaching of the word, uh, which really, in, in, in many cases, doesn't isn't the preaching of the word. It's the preaching of my own uh, opinion. One of my professors that I had in school, Dr. Michael Barrett, <clears throat> wrote in a book, the preacher <clears throat> has neither authority nor right to use the pulpit as a place to express his own opinions on anything. Uh, the pulpit is not a soapbox. Too many preachers have exaggerated, arrogant, and unscriptural notions of their office, whereby they, as they uh, assume the prerogative of dictating the consciences of their people in every sphere of life. And he says, that is popery, and there is no place for it in the church of Christ. <clears throat> so again, there, you know, we could we discuss as far as, uh, you know, <clears throat> the nature of biblical application and the specificity of that application. But uh, the point here is that if we preach Christ, we preach him faithfully, and we're not just standing on a soapbox telling people what we think and how we feel about every <clears throat> matter and issue related to um, life, then we will encourage unity and allow the kind of appropriate Christian liberty to exist and flourish within the uh, church of Jesus Christ. So. Um, those are 15 things that reflect, I think, a, a biblically informed philosophy of preaching that, um, that reflect my intention, the thing that drives me in my preaching of the Word. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you. Um, we have two minutes. <clears throat> if uh, someone wants to ask a question... I'd say jump at it because you've got two minutes to ask it if you want to ask something. Um, excellent. Very, very good. Um, and if someone puts something in here, then I will give, I will defer to their question. If not, I will just ask this uh, something I, I put down. It's one out of five questions <laughs> that I wrote down, but we'll just do this one. So, Interesting when you go into, let's say, the prophets or into Acts, the kerygma and Acts, the preaching in Acts, and so forth, um, you, you don't see them, let's say, walking step by step through a passage of scripture or so forth. Yeah, you know, Acts 2, you have Peter definitely doing some exegesis and he's working with specific texts and so forth. But you see this also immense amount of variety in, in what they're doing. So how much, when we look at their examples, how much are these things, are these examples, um, are they really giving us an example and, and they should be driving, they should be directing our way? How much are we differing from what they're doing? And um, just how, how do we integrate our own pattern against what they're doing as a paradigm? Sure. Well, yeah, that's a fantastic question. It's actually a difficult question because the, um, the sermons, for example, that you have recorded in Acts are actually part of a, um, um, a two-volume work written by Luke. And so Luke is writing his gospel and he's writing the book of Acts. And both of those are, both of those have literary purposes, right? Both of them have an intention behind them. And so Luke, in Luke's record of the history of the early church and his record of the preaching of the early church, he is selecting out um, 
content, he select, he, he's purposefully selecting out certain aspects of those sermons to communicate his literary point, uh, which means that, that, that um, what we're looking at is shaped by Luke's design under the Spirit's uh, ministry, of course, supervision. But um, so, so I'm not sure how paradigmatic those sermons should be for us. And I think, you know, obviously you're looking at a period of transition. I think, I think the, the basic principles that come out of that is the preaching of Christ and um, uh, the preaching of Christ from the scriptures. I mean, obviously these, these men are preaching Christ from the Old Testament and they're showing the connections and the correlations. And so they're preaching uh, in ways that are consistent with those Old Testament texts. But, um, um, and, and e- even when you look at the uh, New Testament letters of the Apostle Paul, I mean, he's writing as an apostle. So, you know, we really don't have the apostolic advantage <laughs> that uh, Paul has. So what, what we do have is this charge to preach the apostolic doctrine. Um, and I think we can be in, we can get some help through the pattern and the example of the apostles, but I don't, personally, I don't feel like we necessarily need to take our exact cue from their particular method or their particular, um, mode of communication. Because again, those records of their communication are coming in the form of, a, uh, a gospel account, or, or not, not a gospel account, but in, but in a, um, a historical narrative written by Luke to accomplish a certain purpose and to make a particular theological point. So, I, you know, honestly, I think that's, um, I would love to see somebody write on that. I've had that question before, and I have looked and looked and looked and looked for answers and have found very little written on that. So, uh, you know, if you want to write another dissertation, uh, that would be a great that would be a great study because it really uh, you know it really has bothered me for some time that you know that 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 to me seems like a really big question um, how much of the preaching of the apostles is paradigmatic and to what extent should we take our cue from them uh, whether it's hermeneutically or homiletically and uh, I just haven't seen a lot written in that area. That's helpful though. I appreciate that. That's that's uh, good thoughts there. Thank you. Um, I wish we had more time. We yeah. don't. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's close out our time here. Just a quick reminder as we go, here is your homework for the next lecture. And so be sure to take a look at this in preparation for what Dr. David Minnick will be sharing with us on hermeneutics. Everything that Dr. McGonigal has emphasized in terms of our task to share the message, okay, the hermeneutical lecture is going to help you working with the text to understand that. So that's kind of the first step. It's the foundational process in, in then understanding in order to communicate. So um, great. Dr. McGonagall, thank you very much. Thank you for thank your time. You. It, was a, it was a joy to, um, to teach the class. I, tr- I trust you guys will really benefit from your study and may God bless you as you preach Christ Jesus. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I will close out the class here and we'll look forward to seeing you all on Friday. So thank you all for your time. Have a great uh, rest of your day.